Jacksonville number one, aren't you, Bob? Yeah, someone who reported um, a car stolen. It's a 95 Honda Civic. You know who stole it? No, I don't. Uh, it's a 95 Honda Civic. Somebody just took off. My what? kid is in the back of the car. Okay. What color is it? It's a bright orange. You can't miss it. 95 Honda Civic. Which way did it go? I mean, I just seen it. I tried to run towards the uh, street, but it looked like it went left, but I couldn't tell. And then by the time I got from the back of the neighborhood, I think had already. Okay. On July 24th, 2015, 32 year old William Reuben Ebron Jr. made a call to 911 dispatchers from the Jacksonville Police Department. The dispatcher was momentarily caught off guard as not only was he reporting a car being stolen, but his girlfriend, Lana Lorimore Barton's 21 month old son, Lonzie Barton, had been abducted along with his vehicle. Little did anyone know that the search for the little boy would go on to be one of the biggest missing child cases in Jacksonville. You lied at least twice in here today. Okay. Yes. Yes. Don't get smart with me. Well, I'm not. Okay, because I'm here. Saying. Listen, I'm I'm third. I'm the third day burning a candle trying to find your son. Yes. Sir. Okay. When you were sleeping, my ass was here. Okay. As the investigation intensified, police uncovered several alarming clues that suggested something more sinister was afoot. This is less of a missing persons investigation, more of a homicide investigation. Uh, days have slipped by. Twenty-one month old is out on his own somewhere. That is, uh, that is a turn of events that's, that's bad, and it begins to uh, keep going the same. Where was Lonnie? What was the truth behind his kidnapping? With a population of 970,000 as of 2022, Jacksonville is the most populous city in the state of Florida. It's also the county seat of Duval County. Jacksonville is known for its numerous art galleries, thriving music scene, and plenty of museums for history buffs. It's also known for its extensive park system and waterways. It's the perfect mix of urban living blended with outdoor adventure to help one relieve the stress of everyday living. Not only is there plenty to do in Jacksonville, but the cost of living makes it a rather affordable city in which to raise a family. In 2022, Jacksonville's crime rate did peak at a whopping 53%, but there are still areas that are considered safe and family-friendly. However, in 2015, a different crime shook the city. At 2.22 a.m. on Friday, July 24, 2015, 911 dispatchers received a call from Ruben Ebron, who reported his car, a bright orange and black 1995 Honda Civic, was stolen from his Ravenwood apartment complex. The call took a darker turn when Ebron told the dispatcher that his girlfriend's son, Lonzie Barton was in the back seat at the time. He explained to the dispatcher that he tried to chase down the car but was unable to catch up. Within minutes, police arrived at the Ravenwood apartment complex where Ebron lived with his girlfriend, Lana Lorimore Barton, and her two children, 21 month old Lonzie and his five year old sister, Lily. Ebron told officers that he'd been on his way to fetch his girlfriend, Lana, from her job at Wacko's Gentleman Club, where she worked as a dancer. He had placed both Lonzie and Lily into the car to take them along for a drive. But soon after he started the car engine, he realized he'd forgotten something in the apartment. While the car was still idling in the parking lot, he left both children in the back seat and ran up to fetch his things. When he walked out from the room, he saw that Lily had followed him up and wanted to watch TV instead of going to fetch Lana. He put on the movie Aladdin and was going to fetch Lonzie from the car so that the child could stay at home with his sister. However, as he stepped out of the apartment, he saw the car being driven away. Ebron then told officers that he tried to give chase on foot, but couldn't catch up with the vehicle in time. After police interviewed and questioned Ebron about the incident, an Amber Alert was issued and the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office took over the investigation, with the team being led by Sheriff Mike Williams and Chief Investigator Tom Hackney. Officers fanned out and searched the area on foot and by car. Fifteen minutes into the search, Ebron's car was found a mile from the apartment complex. The keys were still in the ignition, but there was no sign of Lonzi in the car or anywhere nearby. Police had hoped that someone who saw a child wandering the streets would call in and report it to authorities, but no such call came. Going back through the questions they asked Ebron, 
Teams of officers visited the laundromat and gas station that Ebron alleged to have visited the day before with both Lance and Lily. Nothing of significance was found in either area. By Friday morning, the community had joined the search for Lonzi. Residents from the Ravenwood apartment complex joined the search effort by handing flyers and putting up missing persons posters in the area to assist the police. Investigators also made contact with Lonzi's biological father, Christopher Barton, who lived in Bakers County. Officers were sent to his home to ask him questions about Lonzi and his possible whereabouts, but Christopher was eventually cleared of any involvement in the toddler's disappearance. A second team of officers visited Lana's workplace and questioned other staff and patrons about anything that seemed out of the ordinary the night before. According to staff, nothing seemed different and Lana was her usual self at work the entire night. But police were still suspicious about Ebron, particularly investigator Tom Hackney, who wanted to take a closer look at the man who was minding the children. Ebron offered no resistance when he was asked to go down to the police station for questioning. Investigators started by asking Ebron to recount the events of the previous night. He stuck to his original story of how the day unfolded. He explained to investigators that he often watched the children whenever Lana had to work. The interview was casual as investigators suspected that Ebron was holding back information that could help them find Lonzi. Lana was also questioned by police and cooperated with the investigation fully. She told officers that she'd left Lonzi and Lily in the care of Ebron while she worked that night. Lana also informed them that she last saw her son before leaving for work at 8.30 p.m. that Thursday night and he'd seemed well and untroubled. Lana was allowed to leave as there was no other information she could provide in the investigation. The officers also allowed her to spend some time with Ebron before his next round of questioning as police watched them through the camera during the breaks in between questioning. It became clear to officers that both Ebron and Lana seemed concerned about each other's well-being, which investigators found strange as they were dealing with a missing child. After Lana was allowed to leave the station, officers returned to question Ebron. Investigators started to ask more leading questions and iron out the creases from Ebron's statements. He eventually admitted to returning to the apartment to pick up cocaine that he planned on selling when he went to pick up Lana from the club. Ebron's frustration with police became noticeable as he started to grow angry and demanded to know if he was being considered a suspect. With no physical evidence to suggest Ebron had a hand in Lonzi's disappearance, Police instead charged Ebron with child neglect for leaving Lonzi and Lily in the running car and slipping away to get drugs for himself. As a result of this, Ebron was detained at the county jail. With Ebron behind bars, police started to dig into his personal background and discovered his disturbing criminal history. Police found several court documents filed against Ebron in Duval County dating back as far as 2005. These charges included armed robbery and assault charges brought against him by his ex-girlfriend. Ebron was also given probation for a grand theft auto charge. According to the court documents, Ebron was also accused of harming both his ex-girlfriend and their son after he violently assaulted her while she was carrying the child. He'd also been accused of stalking by his ex-girlfriend. To add on to this, he also attacked one of her sisters, which led to the sister being hospitalized. Ebron also threatened to shoot his ex-girlfriend's 12-year-old niece and also had a drug charge carried over from Bakers County. But that wasn't all. There were new charges brought against Ebron by the same ex-girlfriend who alleged that he assaulted her in the apartment he shared with Lana and her children on July 1, 2015. The assault occurred when she'd gone to fetch the children she shared custody of with Ebron. This occurred while Lana's children were in the living room. These charges painted a very dark picture of Ebron. Police began to question if there was more to the disappearance of Lonzi than what their main suspect was telling them. But even though police were questioning Ebron's version of events, the search for Lonzi didn't stop. By Saturday, over a hundred police officers were deployed to search the surrounding parks and forested areas. Bloodhounds and other canines were used in the search for the missing toddler. Searches by helicopter were conducted over the heavily wooded areas in and around Jacksonville. He was blue-eyed and blonde, 
the image of a cherub, as many people would say. His young life was one of turmoil with a disrupted family life, and people were desperately trying to locate him. On Sunday, July 28, 2015, police dive teams started searching the lakes and waterways in and around Jacksonville. They believed it was possible that a child his age could have wandered into one of the water bodies without any adult supervision. But soon, the weekend stretched into days, and there was still no sign of Lonzi. After 10 days of intensive search, police scaled back on search efforts as the possibility of finding Lonzi alive was starting to look bleak. You know, this started uh, Friday morning at about 2.20 in the morning as a report of an auto theft and abduction that, uh, that began search efforts in and around the Briarwood neighborhood where the, uh, where the case was originally reported. Worked from a window of time from Thursday night at 8 p.m. to 2.20 Friday morning when the, when the report was called in through 911. Our efforts now have, uh, have turned, again, like I alluded to before, this is, this is less of a missing persons investigation, more of a homicide investigation. The sheriff's office released a statement to the public and urged anyone with information to come forward. A fund was set up and an amount of 12,800 US dollars was raised by the public. Police announced that the money would be used as a reward to be given to anyone with information that could lead to the discovery of Lonzi. But police were about to stumble across key evidence that made the case take a dark and twisted turn. After scouring the neighborhood for information, investigators found an important piece of video evidence. A residential CCTV security camera picked up a video of Ebron's orange Honda speeding down the road toward the area where the car was located. About 10 minutes later, the same camera picked up Ebron running away from the direction of the car and toward the apartment complex. When police reviewed the timestamps, they discovered the call that Ebron made had come another 10 minutes after he was seen running back on camera. Police confronted Ebron with the video evidence, and he didn't have an answer for them. He insisted that he didn't do anything to Lonzi, but police theorized that he'd harmed Lonzi and used the abduction as a cover-up story. Ebron refused to answer any further questions and wanted a lawyer to be present when he next spoke to police. Investigators were convinced that Ebron was involved, but they didn't know if Lana had played a part in the cover-up and decided it was time to bring her in for questioning once again. What stumped police was that Lana being a mother would have knowingly allowed such a violent man to take care and live in the same apartment as her children. It also baffled them that she allowed him to openly use drugs and sell them near her young children. Lana was brought in by police after the surveillance footage was publicly released. In her interview with investigators, it turned out that she'd been withholding information and the interview became heated. What? You're blowing smoke up our ass. I am not on. trying to do that. Calm no, down, I'm not. calm down, because I'm telling you. You're absolutely right, though, and I should, I don't really. So, don't so far, so lie. far, this is where you're at. I've got at least two times you've lied to us in this investigation. You've lied twice in here today. <clears throat> Correct? Say about, yes. About the. Anything. You lied okay. at least twice in here today. Okay. Yes. Yes. Don't get smart with me. Well, I'm not. Okay, because I'm, I'm here. Listen, I'm I'm third. I'm the third day burning a candle trying to find your son. Yes, sir. Okay, when you were sleeping, my ass was here. Okay? Lana had previously told officers that she met Ebron while working as a dancer at Wacko's. He visited the club regularly and was one of the primary sources for herself and the other dancers to buy drugs. They began a romantic relationship, but bonded over their use of drugs. Police started to focus on her initial reaction to the news about Lonzi's disappearance that night. According to officers who had been searching for Lonzi that Friday on foot, Lana was interviewed while on her way home. During the questioning period, she denied knowing who Ebron was and had no idea about the incident. When confronted with the responses that she gave during the street interview, Lana alleged that she didn't fully grasp the description of the child given to her by the officer. He already said, we've got an abducted child in a stolen car. I pulled up here because I didn't know if this is the car or not. I know it isn't, but I'm looking for our orange Honda Civic and, and a black male. It was, it was the one report. Do, do you know anything about that then? And then I'm telling him yes. No, you said no. He asked your boyfriend, you have a black boyfriend, 
And, you, and does okay. he have an orange Honestly, honey? Honestly, I wanted to get there and check things, check things out, and make sure. That right, I'm telling him right. That. And that's one. That's the first little I thing wanted, I knew. That's I the first little thing that I wanted to see. What was exactly, going on Christina myself. said exactly that before I, you know. Right. Before I told them something was wrong right. or right or whatever, I wanted to see Correct. if it was my kid that was missing, Correct. if it was Ruben or not. I didn't Correct. tell them that that was my situation if it wasn't. Right. That's so there. The truth. Now. That's the truth. Okay. Right. That's what Christina said. You told her, hey, I only because she she was upset that you lied because she knew, mm -hmm. right? Tell me where I'm wrong. I'm, I'm she was kind of upset, like, "Hey, why are you doing this?" You know, and, and you said, "I want to, I want to see what's going on before I, I talk with them or something to that effect." Or, I want to talk yeah. with Ruben. You know, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that it was actually my kid, not Danny's, right. or someone else. You know, that had come over because, like I said, we do babysit other people's children. Right. I wanted to make sure it was my kid for sure. That was. Well, he told you, Ebron. Yeah, but. That, you didn't know if it was going to be I Lexi it, or... Exactly. I didn't know if it was my kid. Is that what you're kid. saying? Yes. I didn't know if it was my kid in the car or not. I just wanted to double check. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get there and Lexi's see. not a white male child. Well, she's... I would call her white. Mm, white male child with a black boyfriend I'm saying, named Ebron. No, you no. still You knew he was talking about yours. I just wanted to make sure. It wasn't set in... It's like... That it was, was set in stone. Hold on. It was set in stone. It was set in stone. She told the officer in a prior interview that she believed Lonzi may have crept into the bedroom and overdosed on Ebron's stash of drugs and that it was possible Ebron was just covering up his actions. What do you think happened? What do I think happened? Right. Um, I think that he wasn't watching him well when something happened to him. And I think maybe he got a hold of something out, you know, out of his drawer or off the dresser or out of the floor somewhere you know or something and maybe you know accidentally overdosed or something like that or and he freaked out and he come up with something quick to you know make it look like something else in the third interview she told the same officers that the story about Lonzi's overdose was fast growing into a rumor around the area i think that he wasn't watching him properly and, and i think that he either uh that he either got he either Say, it, say opinion it. is he either he probably either drowned in the bathtub or he wasn't watching him in our room and he got a hold of something he probably shouldn't have. Right. Those are the You're only right. two logical things that I can think of. You're right. Lana also admitted that Ebron had called her that Friday morning and told her to find her own way home after work. She then confessed that she and Ebron had gotten into a heated argument before she left for work that evening. This was over a bruise she found behind Lonzi's ear. Lana also pointed out that Lonzi had been lethargic the entire day and a yellow substance had been oozing from his ear before she started her shift. This confession did not make the police feel sorry for Lana. Instead, they questioned her responsibility as a mother, especially since she was fully aware of Ebron's past and violent nature. On August 18, 2015, Lana was also charged for child neglect and giving false information to officers during an investigation. Lana was detained at the county jail, but was released on a surety bond of 50,000 US dollars six days later. However, Ebron remained behind bars after investigators discovered he'd smuggled in contraband and had attempted to make an escape during a court appearance through information supplied by another inmate. A court judge ultimately ruled that Ebron couldn't have contact with anyone regarding the case, either directly or indirectly. This came after prosecutors got hold of recorded conversations between Ebron and his ex-girlfriend. He was allowed to speak with his parents while under supervision of his lawyers to prevent him from passing messages given his previous attempt at escaping. In the end, the judge ruled that Ebron was allowed no visitors. But as Ebron stood in prison, Lana prepared for a custody case for Lily. However, she was about to dig herself a deeper hole. Soon after her release on bail, Lana reconciled with her estranged husband, Christopher. The two had planned on making some quick cash from a drug sale. After appearing for a custody hearing with regards to their daughter Lily's welfare, both Lana and Christopher made their way to a Baker's County motel. Their plan was to sell a synthetic drug called Mookie, but unbeknownst to them, the entire transaction was being recorded. The couple were arrested and charged with multiple drug offenses. Christopher was given a three-year sentence, while Lana received a higher sentence of seven years. 
both Lana and Christopher lost custody of their daughter, Lily. Lana was dealt a further blow. She had also lost custody of her older daughter, whom she'd had when she was a teenager. Both Lily and her older sister were taken in by their maternal grandmother. Following the constant run-ins with the law, Lana's face started to appear frequently in the media. Her unruly behavior and reckless lifestyle led many to question the identity of Lonzi's biological father. Christopher was adamant that Lonzi was his son, but in order to prove critics wrong, he decided to take a DNA test. In December 2015, the DNA results proved that Christopher was not Lonzi's biological father. Although slowed down, the search for Lonzi continued. On October 17, 2015, a vigil was held for Lonzi by the community members who came out to support the search for the child. It would have been his second birthday. It was January 2016, six months since Lonzi disappeared, and police were still waiting on Ebron to give them answers. In the meantime, Lana pleaded guilty to one count each of child neglect and falsifying information. She agreed to testify against Ebron so that her sentence could be reduced to five years. Altogether, she would serve 12 years in prison. However, on January the 11th, 2016, the case of Lonzi Barton was about to take a very twisted turn. Fearing that Lana was going to pin all the blame on him, Ebron told investigators he was willing to lead them to Lonzi's remains. It was a bittersweet moment for police as they finally got to bring closure to those who had been searching for Lonzi. Ebron led police to an area off Snyder Street near the Phillips Highway in Florida. Under some tires, a black bin bag was discovered and what appeared to be the remains of Lonzi Barton. Ebron agreed to talk to police about what really happened to Lonzi. He explained that he and Lana had put Lonzi into the tub to have a bath. The two of them then began fooling around and had completely forgotten about the child in the tub. After they were done, Lana went to check up on Lonzi and discovered he'd drowned in his water. In a state of panic, both he and Lana agreed to cover up Lonzi's death by burying his body in a remote location and staging a carjacking. Lana would go to work as usual, and he'd stay home and create their false lead in order to throw off investigators. Lana, however, remained adamant that she had nothing to do with Lonzi's death and that he'd overdosed on drugs being kept by Ebron. The search for Lonzi had come to a tragic end. Born just two years earlier, on October 27, 2013, he didn't live to see his second birthday. The youngest child of Lana would forever remain a baby in the hearts and minds of his mother and two older sisters. The identity of his biological father remains a mystery. Although shocked by the tragedy, investigators still needed to determine his cause of death. The skeletal remains of Lonzi were examined to determine the possible cause of death. However, there was no way to determine if he'd drowned or had suffered from an accidental drug overdose. Lonzi's death was ruled as inconclusive. However, the medical examiner confirmed that there were eight blunt force trauma fractures located along his ribcage and two blunt force skull fractures that possibly occurred near the time of his death. Lonzi was laid to rest on April 5, 2016 at the Turner Cemetery in Glen St. Mary's, Florida. Both Lana and Christopher's defense teams had requested that both parents be allowed to attend the funeral of their child. After the funeral, they were both sent off to serve out their respective sentences in prison. Ebron agreed to the plea deal he made with the prosecutors and thereafter led investigators to the remains of Lonzi Barton. He was just 21 months old when he lost his life. Ebron was charged with aggravated manslaughter. At his trial in January 2016, Ebron's attorney, James Boyle, did not appear shocked with the autopsy report. He pointed out in court that as per Ebron's statements, Lonzi's autopsies would have shown signs of trauma as he'd been harmed by others. Boyle explained to the court that Ebron had told him and the police investigating the case that Lonzi had returned from Bakers County with visible injuries on his body. Ebron had also told police officers that he'd taken pictures of these injuries and explained to them where he'd stored them on his phone. The prosecution's case was straightforward. They argued that Ebron was also responsible for some, if not all, of Lonzi's injuries. 
Eberron had already confessed to child neglect, using drugs in the presence of minors, falsifying information about Lonzi's disappearance, and trying to cover up Lonzi's death through subterfuge. His actions were inexcusable, according to the prosecution. On February 5, 2016, Ebron was sentenced to 20 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Following the conclusion of the case, Reuben Ebron Sr., Ebron's father, spoke to the media about what he'd learned throughout the investigation. He sympathized with the family of Lonzi Barton and for the pain they endured. Reuben added that he was angered by the people who were meant to protect the child, but instead sought to cause him more harm. He also remarked that Lonzi's short time on earth was surely one of pain and that he's now in a safer place. Reuben did deny that his son was also at fault for Lonzi's untimely death, but he added that Lana's punishment should also be reviewed someday. Today's case is another of those painful cases that led to the death of a child. It's a topic we constantly find ourselves debating as a society. Should some people be allowed to raise children? So today we ask you your opinion on the case of Lonzi Barton. Did Lana Laura Moore Barton receive a rightful sentence? Do you believe that Lana and Ebron were ever speaking the truth? And why is it always too late in cases such as today's? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hit that like button, and share our videos with other crime aficionados. Also, if you have any crime story that you'd like us to cover, leave us a message in the comment section below. Until next time, stay safe.